All right, so part two of uh, our recordings for this week talk about ethics as it relates to the evidence collection and CSI process. So first off, you know, the question is what are ethics? Well, it's the study of our moral standards. So we're looking at, you know, things that are right versus wrong, what's virtue versus vice. So, you know, virtue and vice are, are things where, you know, having a little bit of uh, dessert uh, every so often is, is kind of a virtue, it's a reward, but when all you're eating is sugary foods, that leads to problems, that becomes a vice, and then you have, you know, health concerns that come into play. So, you know, doing something uh, that is a benefit to you versus a harm to you, whether it's to you personally or to your profession, you know, because when you do something wrong, it's not going to be, you know, Joe Lefebvre in the newspaper. It's going to be Joe Lefebvre, police officer, you know, city of whatever police department. They, they, you know, even if you screw up off duty, it's not, you know, Bob Smith. It's Officer Bob Smith of whateverville police department has done something wrong off duty. That, you know, so what are your principles? What are your character? You know, what are the things that uh, guide you? You know, and, and a lot of us have different principles and character. You know, you know we're brought up different ways. Uh, we have different faith systems, whatever the case may be, and those are inherent to you. And our culture of being a police officer, of working for criminal justice, also has some principles and characters about things that we, you know, are uh, willing to accept people doing, and things that we are not willing to accept our own employees doing. And so, you know, by coming into this career path, you might even also have to change some of the things that you hold dear. That and uh, you know, ethics aren't you know, confined to demographics or geographics or anything, you know, we're finding these all over the country, all over the world. You know, I don't care where you go. Um, it's not right to kill somebody. You know, we, we don't like when somebody murders somebody else. That That's just a given. So, you know, there's a lot of things, though, that, you know, maybe uh, we find acceptable in the United States, other countries don't find acceptable, or there are things in other countries that they find acceptable that we don't. So, um, just keep that in mind too, that sometimes our ethical standards can be changed a little bit um, over some geographical areas, but you know, here in the United States, we kind of have you know, some set standards in that. Now, the question is, why does somebody become unethical? Yeah, and this is kind of interesting. I'm sure some of you have, no will have noticed or will notice that in almost every class, we talk about ethics at some level. And you know, why would that be? Well, because we find that folks become unethical. They make small, little, innocent mistakes, and those small, innocent mistakes lead to bigger and bigger and bigger. And oftentimes, it comes back to the fact that you know nobody ever told me I couldn't do this. So you know we're telling you right now, you got to be above board. You got to be up and up at all times if you're going to be part of the criminal justice profession, where you know basically. Whether or not you are honest is a big part of your job. You can't go into court. If you've been caught lying and cheating, you can't go into court and say, well, no, all this evidence was really at the crime scene. I, I swear I found his fingerprints there. Take my word for it. If you've been caught cheating in court, if you've been caught lying on, on the stand, if you've committed perjury, you're done. You're gone. Uh, and oftentimes when we start dealing with folks who have been unethical, a lot of times it comes to the point where, where nobody's ever told them not to be unethical. And so, you know, previous training, previous... Um, stuff has not prevented the unethical behavior. So uh, we are telling you right now, don't do anything dumb. Some of our typical issues, one that, that's really hard for us to combat is sometimes what we call noble cause corruption. And noble cause corruption is the idea where, you know, you're trying to help the victim out. So uh, this is where an officer might plant evidence. This is where an officer, you know, might do something to make sure that the bad guy goes away to prison when in fact the bad guy you know maybe not didn't do this crime um, maybe we're, you know maybe we don't have enough evidence to convict this bad guy but the police officer does something unethical to make sure that that outcome happens that's noble cause corruption you know it seems like you're doing the right thing you know it's it's a noble you know I'm, I'm cheating for a good reason because this is a bad guy and he deserves to go to prison well no there is no such thing as a good reason to cheat Cheating is bad no matter what, so don't do it. Uh, sometimes we have our adaptations where, you know, folks just get cynical. Um, you start to get kind of, you know, an attitude, a chip on your shoulder, if you will. Uh, that's really not good because now you start having, you know, I, I hate everybody, you know. 
uh, I'm not treating you poorly. I treat everybody like crap. That's that's not acceptable. And so we need to make sure that we're um, not getting some of these adaptation things. I mean, yes, sometimes you do have to put your game face on and you have to show very little emotion, but there's a difference between showing little emotion and, you know, having a little bit of empathy for people. And then we have our economic problems. You know, uh, you're at a burglary scene and somebody's, you know, had a bunch of stuff stolen from their house and you realize, hey, you know, they've got this uh, cool iPod or they have, you know, there's a hundred bucks sitting here in the drawer. They already think that everything has been stolen from their house. They'll never miss this hundred dollars. They'll never miss this small electronic device. And so you steal it. And uh, next thing you know, you know, folks are taking bribes and all kinds of different things like that. So um, this is a huge slippery slope. It always starts with the small things. You know, maybe, you know, somebody, uh, you know, uh, you're a traffic cop and somebody offers you, you know, 50 bucks so that they don't get a speeding ticket. And you say, oh, what the heck? You take the 50 bucks. And next thing you know, you know you're going out seeking people uh, to to uh, prey on them and try and get these bribes. All right. So how do we reduce unethical behavior? Well, we do lots of background checks on our employees these days. So, um, you know, we don't just, uh, you know, take applications or resumes and hire somebody who's got the coolest resume. We, we do a good background investigation on people. What were they like? Did they cheat in the past? You know, we go around and we talk to your instructors. We talk to your high school instructors, your college professors, and we find out, did you actually do your work? Did you cheat? Uh, we talk to roommates. When I did background investigations, the people I love to talk to were the exes. You know, exes are going to say bad stuff about people, but is it bad stuff that is just because they're, they're an ex, or is it, are they really giving you the dirt on this person? Um, and it was always kind of interesting because usually you'd say, you know, we're looking to hire them as a police officer. And, you know, you kind of tell the difference very quickly into what is the made up, um, you know, stuff and, and what is really, really like this person's not so good. Um, it was always really interesting. Um, when we hire folks, we don't just, you know, put them on the job and say, well, you got a college degree. No, we assign them to another officer. We do field training, kind of like mentoring. Um, so you're going to work with a partner, hopefully, that um, very consistent in our accountability. Uh, we see it sometimes at some of our agencies where, you know, people screw up and they kind of get, you know, a good butt chewing and that's it. And, you know, you have one supervisor gives you a butt chewing and they don't tell the other supervisors. And next thing you know, you have somebody who has done something bad and they've never been held accountable except for a butt chewing. And uh, so, you know, we make sure that we put a note in your file and say you've done something. Um, good training, like I said, we talk about this all the time, and uh, you know, some, kind, some kind of employee intervention process where if we notice a lot of times we see some of our ethical things coming from, you know, depression and um, substance abuse that comes in, PTSD. So we're being more proactive or we're trying to be more proactive as a career field and, and getting people help if they seem like they're getting kind of a little depressed or having some PTSD issues. So, you know, just some questions to think about. Is it uh, illegal to remove objects from a crime scene without proper authorization? You know, the warrant says you're supposed to be grabbing ABC and you notice XYZ. Can you be grabbing that even though it's not on the warrant? You know, just some things to think about. Should police sell uh, property as fundraising? So, you know, you have lost and found and nobody's claimed it. Should we be able to auction that off? Um, should, you know, you be held accountable for what you're doing off duty? These are some things to really think about, you know. And uh, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's really, you know, without authorization, probably shouldn't be doing that. As for this, um, that's one of those things where, you, you know, every agency looks at it differently. Uh, what are you going to do with all this stuff? Can you donate it? Um, you know, it might be a better option than selling it. And uh, yeah, you definitely should be held accountable for what you do off duty. But again, you know, you got to think about these. Yeah. All right. So code of ethics, uh, many organizations have some sort of a code of ethics, some sort of oath, you say, not just, you know, the oath of office, but an oath of ethical standards. And, uh, you know, that's something that a lot of us have to say when we get hired and maybe periodically, pardon me, recite um, throughout our career at a, at a shift change, that reminder, because, you know, nobody ever told me I, I, I had to be ethical. Well, we're reminding you more and more. Here's a couple of example codes. Um, you know, you can just Google law enforcement oath of honor. You can uh, Google the IAI code of ethics, the IAAI code of ethics, uh, or the, even the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. You know, these are all code of ethics out there that, that you can either recite or, you know, that are um, a document that you can print and sign, a um, number of different uh, options out there, but are just things that, that we're starting to see more and more organizations go to.
than that. Now, something else that comes into play here when we start dealing with ethics is the idea of expert witness. Uh, for the most part, all you're able to testify to in court is things you directly know because you saw it, you experienced it, you touched it, you said it, you were there. In the world of forensics, though, we sometimes are taking a bunch of facts and putting those facts together to come to a conclusion. Remember the scientific method, you know, facts first, assumptions later. So we're making an assumption about what happened at the crime scene and we're telling that story. So we are testifying to things that are an opinion at this point. And in order to testify to an opinion, you have to qualify as an expert. So I'm going to tell you this uh, right now. Get your resume up to date. Keep it. Have a file somewhere. Email it to yourself, a Word document, uh, listing off classes that you're taking, listing off any special activities you're doing in support of your role of forensics, of police work, so that this way if you ever want to testify as an expert witness, the judge will ask for your resume. And you can show, look at all this, look at not only do I have a degree from Fox Valley Tech, but these are the classes I took related to tactical operations and forensics and different things that you did that maybe later you'll want to be able to talk to about as an expert. So you have to show knowledge and skill, uh, and then, you know, when you work, you will gain the experience to become a classified expert. Um, now, expert witness testimony, we actually have federal rules that talk about this, and these rules say that there has to be some sort of test to show that you are an expert. Uh, previously, we used the Frey test, and basically this was an idea where, you know, if the judge saw it, that what you did was generally accepted by the relative uh, relevant community, you'd be an expert. So uh, under the Frey test, I was an expert witness in um, drunk driving and, and drunks um, because in college I was the vice president of my fraternity. And uh, I had made, you know, at that point in my career, like 500 drunk driving arrests. And so the judge was like, well, you've been around a lot of drunk people probably, and uh, you've, uh, you know, arrested a fair number of drunk, you, you got, you're an expert. You know, and that was it. Um, but lately we've moved forward. We now are in the Dalbert standard, um, and every state gets to pick their standard. Uh, Wisconsin transitioned over to Dalbert uh, in 2011, maybe. Uh, it might have been earlier, 2007. So somewhere in that time, I, I want to say it was 2011, though. We, we switched over to Dalbert. Uh, but regardless, when we switched over, um, now you basically need to be showing that you are. Um, you know, have real relevancy. So, you know, what, what exactly is it that is relevant? You have a degree in criminal justice. Great. But is that relevant to this? You know, what, what classes have you taken? And then also, what is your reliability? Um, you know, what is it? What are the steps that you use? Use the scientific method. Facts first, assumptions later. Yeah. So, uh, you know, your credentials are going to uh, go into uh, review uh, your methodologies, everything will go into review and the judge will decide whether or not you're an expert. And it's it sounds daunting sometimes to be qualified as an expert, but actually it's really not that big of a deal. Um, once you do it the first time, you know, it's very easy after that that judges can even take judicial notice that, that well, a previous judge called you an expert, so I'm going to call you an expert too. And so if you ever get qualified as an expert, you throw that on your resume. Um, so that this way, and you put the case number and everything on there, so that this way the judge can say, uh, yes, you're an expert. But this all leads back to ethics, though, right? Because it is you, you, that is basically being viewed here by the judge. What are your methods? What is, what is your reputation? What is your background? And, you know, could you be a, an expert? And this all goes back to our ethics. So um, that's basically what I have to say here. And uh, if you have any questions, as always, shoot me an email. Feel free to give me a call. Stop out to the Public Safety Training Center during my office hours and see me. Uh, otherwise, I will talk to you next week.